cuenta. that fur on it. Some lady just you know, throws down a credit card and spends $40,000 on a fur coat. And uh, you know, I'm just grateful as hell that they support us. But they, they, they may never know or may never care, but when, as it, when somebody puts on a, on a ranch fur coat, they're putting on something that's been you know, very well maintained, very well nurtured. People with a degree in agriculture, especially being Mankin, they raise these things by the millions. Up here, and you, and you buy a piece of wild fur. Is it every piece of fur in here? There's a story. It involves a, a tremendous amount of effort, no, no small amount of uh, hardship, and always every year a fair amount, amount uh, element of risk for every trapper that's here. Pretty darn good. Look at that. Doesn't get any better than that. Gosh darn. Add up. It's not always just the way it always seems. It's harsh out here. So harsh conditions, so carrying capacity of the land is only going to go so far, there will be so many breeding pairs come out in the spring. It's only what the land will support. So as a trapper, I could come in here and I could trap out a lot of uh, I could trap out a lot of Martin early in the year. And I take care of the, uh, I take care, I clean up the, uh, a lot of the migrating population. And instead of the population going through a, through a period of attrition as a, for the carrying capacity, by removing that population, that surplus early in the year, and then backing off and leaving them alone, I can guarantee that there will actually be more breeding pairs come the fall because they're not competing and solely running out of a dwindling food supply. You don't see it as much in wintertime because right now, Right now, is that, uh, this is a busy place. The forest is a very busy place in the wintertime, but you don't see it as the, like you do in the summer. In the summer, this is like the busiest city in the whole world. Is that, uh, as, even as the snow is melting and the water begin to run, there's already algae that start growing in the water. And as if you're out here beaver trapping, you start seeing everything coming up as the ducks and the geese show up and as the algae start in the water. And as every 24 hours, you'll see a, 
you'll see a, a very significant change in the forest. When you're connected to it that way, when you see it from that point of view, when you're, when you're out there all the time, you just know in your guts that, that this here wasn't all, this complicated system wasn't just an accident. Whether it was designed or whether it's just thousands or millions of years of, of change have made it that way, but it's absolutely no accident that, that, this is, that these things happen the way they do. Urban people are probably way ahead of everybody anymore in understanding that this is that we have to look after our environment, we have to look after those things. At the same time, this is, you know, is that I'm not so sure as that there is there as quick I'm picking up on the fact is that it's more complicated than just like, let's not kill a wolf and we've saved the wilderness. Or let's find some other cute and charismatic animal like a wolverine or a marten or a river otter and not take a look at the need for managing. So I want to congratulate you guys. I also want to thank Ray for organizing this up. Yeah, Ray, that was, that was a really big deal. So we do a number of these. We do a number of these courses every year. And uh, what's interesting about the one that I'm doing at Sturgeon Lake right now is that uh, a lot of them are extremely good trappers, and uh, many have taken uh, the Alberta Trapper Education course. But what's historical here is this is the first time. That they've uh, that they've ever had, actually did a full course for the band on the reserve. One of the most important things that I could tell you guys right now, as I talk to you guys about that graveyard in Callowit, and how deeply that impacted me, is that I hope you guys catch lots of catches. I hope you guys catch lots of fur, and I hope it's wonderful. But I'll tell you right now, as a professional trapper, is that if you can't do it ethically, if you can't do it humanely, then I hope you never catch a piece of fur in your life. It's always about, as Thomas Kuhn said, it's as always with love, with honor and respect. And that's the only way that you'll ever be a successful trapper. And that's the only way that you'll ever get the most that the bush is going to offer back to you. The 28 hour course we have here in Alberta is considered to be one of the best, if not the best, of uh, trapper education courses across uh, in North America. Uh, trappers are the front line of disease control when it comes to wildlife management, so we spend a lot of time on, on disease. Is it, you know, as well, we, we have a role to harvest fur is that we also we want to do that sustainably so we spend a lot of time talking about wildlife management when we go through the biology of the different fur bearers we talk about uh, about harvest methods in terms of what what's sustainable what a person should be looking at recognizing the carrying capacity of the land for each individual species <laughs> i'm trying to make it as natural so what as he goes down the trail there's no room yes. for him to pass <laughs> So you're okay if you use a killing device, you don't have to check it, uh, regular trap checks, you can go check it when you want, because the animal's dead. The only time you check it every 24 hours here, because you don't want that animal to suffer once he's in a trap. I was never really a bush person. Although I was raised by my grandparents and we lived in a tent 40 below trapping, I was there with them. So I had, you know, I remember the memories of trap, the trapping days. We need to pass this on to our kids, our grandkids. So once we're gone, you know, 
it'll live on, like pass it. So this is awesome what Ray J did. It, we've never had this in the community, this course. I never used the trap, I used the snare. And when you're doing a cubby, do you want your trigger in or out? Yeah, it depends on how you want the animal to yeah. I think I wanted more out that way. Snap. Somebody's built a lynch pen before. And what I used is uh, the bark, spruce, and a few twigs. So I made sure that there's no root, any space there for it to crawl, sneak. So it has to go straight into that box. And you wouldn't believe what I use. Bread crumbs and cheese. It always works. <laughs> Serious? <laughs> She's <laughs> selling a product here. I'm selling. <laughs> and um, I think I'll check it till maybe uh, next summer. <laughs> it's so important because you know, with the uh, economy, economy and it, the hard times, it, it, there's so much. Like even the power is so high. We need to go back to the olden days. That's how come I will never sell my trap line, even though I've had offers wanting to buy it. I said, no way, I can't. Yeah, you just put your foot right across both sides and you don't have to step down hard or anything like that. It's not like you're doing something really, really brave or anything like that. All you're doing is just, is it, uh, just all you do is just put your foot on it and then, uh, and then, and then go from there. So. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. I just made it look really easy. Yeah. <laughs> you should have caught your toe. <laughs> An elder a long time ago had told, told me tough times are coming ahead. And now I see it. Like, look at all the animals, the water's getting contaminated. And well, even the beef, you know, the mad cow disease. Well, even the moose, it's going to be kind of scary. juvenile that's what happens something else is it's another martin in the area it always seems to me when the, every time I, is it, he's probably traveling with another juvenile dealing with wolves that were predating on uh, predating on livestock and creating lots of problems for us folks over there. Came from there as it uh, got home we as it uh, I flew into flew into Edmonton, drove up to Grand Prairie, uh, had a sleep, my wife and I got in our in our in our in a vehicle, drove to Yellow Knife, hopped on a plane, spent the night there, hopped on a plane, then flew over to a Calot. When my wife and I walked down onto the beach, here's a great big graveyard as it was easy to dig on the beach, it's one of the few places where they can dig a hole, so the rest of it's all granite. Is it, uh, here's a great big graveyard and way outsized for the size of a Calouette, which you know, six or seven thousand people. Way outsized for that. 
And it's a lot of those graves are fresh. Suicides. What do you do when, when, when you feel like there's no hope? When you feel like there's no hope and you feel like there's nothing else? Is it, you might as well off yourself. Yeah. There we are. We're pretty pleased at that. Is that pretty cool? And Allie, Allie asked her about it, and she said, well, you know, and, and, and a callot, I can buy 15 or 20 things for $100, where she says, and, and Coral Harbor, you could never buy 10 things for $100. You know, think about that when you, know, you, you, go, you go to a grocery store down here with, all, you know, 100 different kinds of cornflakes, and is it uh, for $30, you can walk out with four bags full of stuff. So for those people up there to be able to buy, out, buy other things is they need to be able to sell it fur. They need to be able to sell the seal pants. There is another job. So they can't just go get a job at a 7-Eleven or a job pumping gas. They don't, it is like Alberta here where every person has at least three job offers going and will for the rest of their lives. And for the foreseeable future, it's just going to be it's good. They don't have that up there. It, it hit me really hard that, that every time... If we don't do things down here right, if we don't do things humanely, sustainably, if we aren't thoughtful, if we don't look, if we don't look, uh, look at the at the larger picture, and is it see our place in the environment, and and uh, our role as managers, as stewards of the land, and if we don't do it with with honor and with dignity and respect, is that we lose ground down here for our hunting and trapping community. That's pretty bad. It would definitely impact myself and thousands like me. Hundreds of thousands of hundreds of definitely impact. But is it no impact like will those people up in, in Pangner Tang, in Crease Fjord, in Iqaluit, is it where they don't have, where they have very few options? And is it every time there's a big mess down here, every time the activists go in another campaign and talking about stuff that they have absolutely no idea about, relying on emotionalism and sens sensationalism, is that they're contributing directly to that graveyard in Iqaluit, to all those graveyards up there. There's blood on those people's hands.